Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I think that you're going to be so caught up in what we're doing uh, and a new perspective on an age-old problem that's been, I think, handled very badly in the church and that I don't think the time will be significant to you. I need to go back at the very beginning and pick up uh, a verse or two that we didn't finish last time. And so let's pick up with verse 19. And verse 19, down, verse 19 through 21, is characterized by four present participles and the grammatical link which they relate to is be filled with the Spirit. Now, I want to go back on that just for a minute. Be filled with the Spirit. Present, passive, imperative. Lifestyle action. Continue being filled. Passive, not from ourselves, from God. Imperative, command. Being filled with the Spirit is the norm for the church of the living God. Being filled with the Spirit is a continual day-by-day lifestyle control of the Spirit of God. It is the norm. It is not the exception. It is day-by-day. It is not once for all. It is done by God, not by the individual. Now, related to that, be filled with the Spirit are these four participles. Now, let's look at them. Number, the first one is found speaking to one another. The second one is found, singing. The third one is psalming. The fourth one is giving thanks. And there is a fifth one, but it changes somewhat, and I'll talk about it in verse 21. I think music has such a meaningful place in my own life. For I have found that God speaks to me much more clearly and much more deeply through music than He does through preaching. I do not enjoy listening to preaching. Even people that I admire so greatly as Billy Graham, uh, usually I don't enjoy. Black preachers turn me on as nobody else can. If I got to hear preaching, I want to hear a black preacher. <laughs> they just send me right through the roof. Uh, but normally music is what really gets to me the quickest. I have a tape deck in the suburban, the church is suburban, and I play very often. Uh, music. I like rock and roll. I play that a lot. But it, uh, when I get tired of that, I love to hear the Christian cassettes. They, they get me in the mood to minister, and they help me stay in the right attitude about ministry. And I, I love music. And the early church was like that. One of the related examples of being filled with the Spirit is music. And there's three of these five participles are related to music. Look what it says. The first participle is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I don't know if there's a distinction between these. I really think that they're synonymous. He's just trying to add as many different words to get the whole scope of music as he could. If we wanted to make a distinction, maybe a practical distinction that I would make to you is, uh, I like uh, save, 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 you know. I I like uh, turn your radio on. (laughs) Uh, I like some of those kind of gospel songs. Uh, I like some special singers. I like uh, Cynthia Clawson. I like Evie. They just really do something to me. Where other ones that are equally as gifted, equally as uh, efficient, and equally as meaningful to others just don't do that much for me personally. And so in church music, we try to offer the complete scope of everything from the very high, beautiful uh, hymns, melodies from the past, to the very modern, very uh, upbeat hymns of the day. We try to meet everybody's need because I think these, saying these two different words is trying to say that maybe there's different strokes for different folks. Some of us enjoy different things in music and God covers the whole gamut as He speaks to our hearts in many different ways and in many different kinds of music. So speaking to one another and how should we speak to one another? I loved uh, one of the things they did in Norway so much. Uh, they were a singing people. When they sat down to dinner, they always had a song before they ate. 
When they got together as a group, they always had a song. It was a fellowship group or a prayer group. They always sung together. And there was something about that singing together uh, that really set the mood for worship and, and, and fellowship. I think that in a real sense, our lifestyle ought to be characterized by singing the gospel message everywhere we go. You ever known somebody who hums the words of faith? You know? Uh, that's a real witness. That's a real witness. Speaking to one another, not uh, in words, but in songs. Now, Randy, next time I sing to you and you wrinkle your nose at me, uh, when I sing uh, farther along, Randy leaves the office. <laughs> so, see, it's biblical. I get to do it. Uh, singing to one another. I like that. A way of fellowship and communication on a new level. And then it talks about praying. And my thing has keep on praying and praising the Lord. But the Greek has... Keep on singing and psalming. You didn't know psalming was a verb, did you? Keep on singing and psalming to the Lord. Have you thought, now I know you get in the bath, bathtub, and don't we all sound good in the bathroom? Man, I can sing with great quality with uh, those tiles around me. I just echo, it reverberates, it sounds terrific. Just turn the water up louder if things get bad. Have you ever thought that we can sing back to the Lord? Have you ever learned songs to sing back to Him in praise? Learned uh, putting like the Psalms to music or Scripture passages to music? Have you ever thought that's a real ministry to God as we sing back His Word to Him? And that does something to our heart as we let, let Him hear our worship in that. Right? Singing and psalming, I like that. To the Lord, with all of your heart. Praise God it didn't say with all of your talent. It said with all of your heart. <laughs> And uh, I remember a man I, I met at, at Sagamore Hill, and I didn't know him for nothing, but I was sitting on the second pew one night, and we started singing. I heard someone, heard their voice. He was sitting in the back in the far corner, and he was singing so loud that everybody around him was <laughs> moving to the aisle, you know, trying to get out of the vibration. Since then, I began to love that man with great compassion. He enjoyed singing. He was a bachelor, so his wife never got on him about singing too loud in church, but, uh, oh, he would just roar and enjoy it, just smile and sing. That is terrible. <laughs> but he loved to sing, you know. I, I, I like that. Singing to the Lord with all your heart. I think that means not just uh, how your voice sounds or the volume, but I think it really means with sincerity. I think one of the greatest sins of contemporary Christianity is we sing the hymns of the faith without cognitive understanding of the words. To sing a hymn without understanding, in my opinion, is like praying a prayer that somebody else wrote that you never read before. There are some hymns that I think are theologically corrupt. And for me to sing those hymns would be lack of faith on my part, and I'll never do it. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, is one of those. Jesus never passed anybody. So I think we ought to know what the songs say. I think you ought to have a heartfelt agreement with the words of the hymn to sing it with meaning. And we need to think about that, because I really think we take the Lord's name in vain in singing things we don't understand, or we don't agree with, or we're just doing because everybody else is doing it. And uh, it goes on, the next one says, continue giving thanks for everything to God our Father. Isn't this a beautiful kind of way about not only singing to one another and, and hymning and, and, and psalming, but giving thanks. That's another thing that characterizes being filled with the Spirit. Not only singing, but giving thanks. For good things, for comforting things, for helpful things, giving thanks for all things. Now, that is the characteristic of being filled with the Spirit. Anybody can give thanks for good things. Anybody can give thanks for things that are pleasing and comfortable. Anybody can give thanks for those. But the characteristic of the Spirit-controlled life is giving thanks in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5, 13. So I think... One way of being controlled by the Spirit is singing all the time and giving thanks in all circumstances. I think that's extremely meaningful. Now, notice verse 21. Your Bible probably does not have a paragraph division there, but I think there is a paragraph division in verse, beginning in verse 21. There is a fifth present participle, but the other four participles have been present participles, present active participles, this, in verse 21, is a present middle participle. And you say, big deal. It is extremely important in our discussion tonight of the family relationship to understand what a present middle participle does. 
So let me translate verse 21 that I begin a new paragraph with like this. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence to Christ. Submit yourselves. Submit yourselves. Present middle imperative. As a manner of your life, as the normal action of your Christian response day by day, as a characteristic of who you are in Christ, let your life be characterized by submitting yourself to who? One another. Why? Out of reverence to Christ. Let's go back through that. What does the word the verb submit mean? It's made from two Greek words. To arrange under. To arrange under. It's a military term of uh, the orders of command like in the army. Sergeant, uh, private, corporal, that kind of thing. Major, general. It, it, it is a putting yourself in a proper relationship to an order or a command structure. Now, that's what the military term means. But if you have a concordance, and if you don't have concordance, you're not a student of the Word of God. I just put it bluntly. You've got to have a concordance. You've got to have a reference Bible to be a serious student of the Word of God. Exclamation point. If you look in your concordance on the word submit, you will find that Paul uses this verb over 20 times in his epistles, and he relates it in every area of life, not just wives to husbands, but he relates it to younger to older. He relates it to Jesus' parents to Jesus, to the Father to the Son. He relates this word in every relationship. Our Christian lives are to be characterized by submitting ourselves to one another for Jesus' sake. That means get off your rights and get on with humility. That means get off what, what you think you ought to do and what you push what I should do and what I can do and start putting others to the forefront. Ephesians 4, 2 is a good parallel. Uh, Romans 12, 8 or 12, 10 is another good parallel about what it means to submit to one another. We should all be in a submissive relationship to one another in Christ. Now, in Christ, in fear of Christ, in awe of Christ, is why and how that I can be submissive to you. My nature is not submissive. My nature is uh, very, very leadership-oriented. I tend to take control of groups that I get to be a part of, and I have to watch as the plague not to do that. I have to watch all the time of not taking too much control. Now, the only way that I can handle that, that's part of my sinful nature, I think, as well as part of my spiritual gift. The only way I can handle that is in Christ. And that is the only way that, it, that those kind of things can be yielded. But I need to be submissive to Peggy, to my children at times, to you, to people who are ugly, to people who do reject everything this church stands for in Christianity. I need to be submissive to the church family and to those outside the church in a very real and meaningful way. And it is not a command in the sense of, uh, I'm saying do it, but it's a command in the sense of yield yourselves. It is a voluntary thing on our part where God says, you yourselves submit. Now, someone doesn't submit for you. You submit for yourself. Now, this is, in my opinion, the universal principle that is going to be applied three ways. Paul is going to say, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of Christ. And then he's going to say, wives to husbands. And then he's going to say, children to parents. And then he's going to say, slaves to masters. And he's going to do it all the way through Ephesians 6. So the universal principle is submission one to another with three domestic examples one of which we'll cover tonight in the area of husband and wife relationships. Now, I need to set the pattern, and I need to say a couple of introductory words. I am committed to interpreting the Bible in what is known as the historical grammatical method. The main thing I want to do is try to find out what the author was trying to say using grammar 
and using the historical situation of his day. I do not want to read my views and my prejudice and my culture and my age into the Word of God. I want to say as clear as I can to our culture what Paul said to his culture as I believe he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I have got to try to get these glasses of 20th century America mail off of me to interpret this correctly. And for you to interpret it correctly, you have got to put aside everything you think this says, that you know what it means, and we've got to look at the grammar and the background and see what it does say, not what we've always heard it said or what we know it says. We cannot come to the Bible knowing what it says. We must come to the Bible as learners submitted to the Holy Spirit. So let's just try to get off the glasses. Let's look at the cultural situation. Women in Paul's day were little more than possessions to be used or chattel to be traded. You say, I don't believe it. Did you know that most Greek women never left their home after marriage? They did not eat with their husbands. They did not even sleep with their husbands until the husbands came to their room to which they were kept and never were allowed to go out alone. The Jewish world was not any better. There was a tokenism to women in the Old Testament, but the rabbis had locked down so tightly that women had no rights at all, and men had all the rights. Only in Macedonia was there some degree of uh, women being somewhat allowed some freedoms in Paul's day. So Paul, now listen to me, Paul is speaking a positive. Now you're going to... When you read this, you think Paul's speaking negative. Say wise, be subject, is to say something negative in our day. But when Paul said it, it was surprisingly, astonishingly, eye-openly positive. He wasn't saying something bad. He was saying something radical. He was trying to give a balance to a system that was overbalanced as far as men. Jesus and Paul raised women to a plane that they had never been raised to before. The great emancipator of women is Jesus Christ. And we'll see that. But know that in Paul's day, he was saying something radically positive, not something negative. I also want to say to you, this context is determined or colored by two other scripture passages. Genesis 2 which is the creation of man out of dust and the creation of woman out of man. And 1 Corinthians 11.3, which is Christ is the head of every man, man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. Now, those two form the general uh, spheres of orientation around which Paul is going to speak in this chapter, which I think is the chapter on Christian marriage, not... Uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Now, by saying those things, let me go on with verse 22. You married women must continue to live in subordination to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, how many of you women got that as a wedding present? <laughs> your husband gave that to you in gold, right? To hang over your bed or something? Uh, put on your bathroom mirror? Let's go back to do you look at your Bible? Look down at your Bible. Look at verse 22. Do you see the word be subject in italics? Does your Bible have it in italics, which means it's slanted slightly? That means it's not in the Greek. The Greek says, wives to husbands as to Lord. No verb. The verb is supplied from verse 21. But that, really, the verb is used many times, so I think it's an accurate translation to put the verb be subject. Now, Colossians 3.18, Titus 2.5, 1 Peter 3.1 or other examples where this verb is in the Greek talking about husbands and wives and especially wives to husbands. Now, why would Paul talk about the women first? Why not talk about the man first? In Paul's day, he's going to say something radical about women anyway. Of course he starts with the woman. Where else would he start if he's going to say something positive in an overbalanced society? Now, what is he saying? He's saying wives to husbands as to Lord. If you supply the verb from the previous verse, it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. It is not a command. It is a way of saying, do it yourself. It is a way of implying voluntary submission on a regular basis. Now, why? 
Does that mean to the Lord? Does that mean that the husband is to the wife as, as Christ is to the wife? Absolutely not. It's not that the husband, that the wife should be subject uh, to her husband as she is to Christ. But it's saying as she is subject to Christ in the sense of being under his authority, so too she ought to be to her husband. It's not saying the husband is as the Lord, but it's saying the relationship is analogous. Now, we're not talking about despotic husbands. We're not talking about, I'm going to snap my finger and you jump as high as I say. We're not talking about domination in every area of life, but we are talking about the orders of creation that put man before woman. We are also talking about the orders of creation, that woman was tempted first and all of mankind through that temptation. And Paul the rabbi goes back to Genesis and picks up on this and look at the unique way he does it. Verse 23, for a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, parenthesis I think, his body and savior of it, close parenthesis. What does the word head mean? We've been talking about bodies and heads, and, and does this mean the husband is the head and the wife's the rest of the body? Is it that kind of analogy? No. This is a Hebrew use of the word head. And in Hebrew, the word head is not an organic thing. That's Greek. In Hebrew, the word head meant uh, the leader of the tribe, the one in charge, uh, the one who was in authority. So we're, we're talking about that man is in authority as Christ is in authority. Now, what does that mean? That sounds very strong. Let's go on, if we could, please. When he adds little princess, savior of the body, I think he's saying that even though a husband and wife is somewhat analogous to Christ and the church, that there is a distinction in that Christ is the savior of the church, where the husband is not the savior of the wife. Now, some interpret this word savior, meaning the Old Testament use of the word savior, meaning deliverer or protector. If that's what it should be, then there is a sense in which the husband is the protector of the wife, and they still may be analogous here. Now, look, listen to what I said, verse 24. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so married women in everything must be subject to their own husbands. All right? Does in everything mean in everything? No. You say, well, it says in everything. Why doesn't it mean in everything? If you tiptoe through the Bible that literalistic, I promise you, you can't live with what you get out of it. You've got to take all the revelation and see what all the revelation says. Is it true that a woman should be subject in everything to someone else? What does Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 39 say? It says that Jesus did not come to bring peace but a sword and members of their own household would be against you and mother against daughter and uh, father against son and if you don't love me more and it missed a whole bunch then you're not worthy of me. In everything has to be put in the context of domestic relationship. Wives are related to Christ's priority and only to their husbands voluntarily. But every woman is related directly to Jesus Christ and anything that she does must be first of all understood as God's will for her life in Christ and only after that does the family come. That's the same with the man. The man's priority is not family but Jesus Christ. So too the wife. So I don't believe that everything means in everything. It just, it just simply cannot. Now, does this make women inferior that Paul has implied they need to be subject to their husbands? Is there anything in the word subject that speaks of inferiority? Let me ask you another question. Does inferiority, uh, well, does equality mean sameness? Does the word equality equate with the word sameness? No. No, it does not. Never has, never will. We're not talking about equality in doing the same thing. We're talking a, about equality in a spiritual sense. Galatians 3, 28. There is no more Jew or Greek. 
or male or female, or slave or free, we are all one in Jesus Christ, speaks of equality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28, Christ is said to be subject to the Father. Does that make Christ inferior to the Father? In Luke chapter 2, verse 51, it says Jesus was subject to his parents. Does that make Jesus Christ inferior to Mary and Joseph? In 1 Peter 5, 5, it says the younger must be submissive to the older. Does that make age an inequality difference that the older are more quality or, or that? No. It is talking about a relationship, a function, a way of relating to one another and has nothing to do with spiritual equality. Nothing to do with spiritual equality, but everything to do with this voluntary relationship. Now, let me go one more. Just as the church is subject to Christ, present middle participle, just as the church submits itself to Christ's rule, so married women, well, excuse me, I went over that, excuse me, missed it. So married men must love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. The only, the only imperative that is here in relation to being submitting or not submitting, the only command from God through Paul is for the husbands to love their wives. It is a middle verb for the wives to submit themselves. That means voluntarily submit yourselves. But this is not a middle thing here. It says, husbands, continually, as a habitual manner of your life, love your wives. Not eros, sexual love. Not phileo, family love. But agape, God's kind of love. And there is not a woman in the world that would not voluntarily submit herself to any man that loved her like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The problem is that men haven't earned the right for their wives to submit themselves to them. Now there's the problem. That's the biblical command. It's repeated in the end of the chapter. Husbands must Love, no strings attached, unconditional, self-giving, sacrificial, day-by-day -day love is the atmosphere in which wives voluntarily submit themselves. Let me give you an example. When I came to this church, it was a unanimous vote of 200 people that God wanted me here as pastor. I had an office. I had a title. I had a desk. I had a car and I had a paycheck that all said I was pastor of Trinity Baptist Church. But I was not pastor of Trinity Baptist Church. I was the preacher who spoke from the pulpit on Sundays at 2707-34. Only after you begin to know me and trust me and know that even though we may disagree that I am praying about what I do and do love you so, only then did I become the pastor. You voluntarily made me pastor. You voted on me for preacher administrator. After you knew me, you allowed me to become the pastor. Husbands, after your wife knows that you love her as Christ loved the church, there'll be no problem in her part of the deal. The monkey is on both backs. Submission is a two-way street. The Christian home goes both ways. Men, get off your stinking, despotic, domineering pedestal and love that lady as Jesus loved the church and things will change in your home. Wives, get off your prideful attitude and respect that man and love him for what he is in Christ, and there'll be a difference in your home. You say, what happens if one party doesn't? The Bible doesn't say. It's a two-way relationship in the Bible.
Husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Here is that substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Richard. He loved her enough to die for her. Men, how much do you love your wives? Well, I love her as long as that's what I want her to. Terrific. That's just, that's just wonderful. He goes on in verse 26 to say, to consecrate her after cleansing her through his word as pictured in a water bath. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff. Consecrate means to sanctify. A good parallel might be John 17, 17 through 19. It's the idea here, I think, that Jesus uh, uh, sanctified her and cleansed her. What He did something for the church the church could not do for herself. And I want to tell you, the analogous thing is a husband can do something for a woman that a woman can't do for herself. A husband can bring out the beauty of his wife as nobody else and no other thing in the world can. Did you know that? So Christ sanctifies her after cleansing her through his word as pictured in the water bath. Now, what does his word mean? There are several people who think they know. Uh, I think we must admit we don't know. There are a few theories. It may mean Jesus' words. John 15, 3 fits right there. Maybe Jesus' message, the gospel message, may be what it means. It may be the, the formula of baptism. Like when I baptize someone, I say a certain thing. And maybe it, it's speaking about, the, it, of course, the picture here is baptism. So it must maybe a the formula the early church used. But even better than that, I think, it's probably the confession, the public confession of faith that everybody who was baptized made. They didn't have churches in that day. When they were publicly baptized was their time of announcing before men their trust and faith in Christ. They were baptized in public, and when they did, they usually made a confession. I think Romans 9.10 is a, is a baptismal confession. You know, whosoever shall call upon him the Lord shall be saved. I think that is part of this. So it may be even one of those three. As pictured in water baths, I think it refers to baptism, but it's, po it's possible because of the context that we're talking about the bridal bath that the wife took not only in the Hebrew culture, but also in the Greek culture before she was married. Now, it goes on to say, that's the present thing that, he do, that Jesus does to the church. He sanctifies her and cleanses her. By the way, notice sanctification here is not a process, it's aorist tense. There is a real sense if we can talk about justification as being point action and sanctification as being a process, but all that's a bunch of theological gobbledygook in a sense. When Jesus comes into your heart, you're saved, sanctified, cleansed, point action, and anything may be a process beyond that, but it all happens at one time, and the Bible often speaks of that too. Notice where it says here that he might present the church to himself. Notice the church doesn't get herself ready. Jesus gets her ready. That he might present the church to himself. And the word present here is used in presenting a bride to a husband. Fully adorned. Man, the white dress. Have you ever seen ladies look more beautiful when they get married? Have you really? I think ladies look very beautiful, especially at two times in their life. I think pregnant ladies look extremely beautiful, don't you? Me and Mira back when your wife was pregnant, and she is very attractive. I think it brings out part of their femininity and their womanness when they're pregnant. I think it's a beautiful time of their life. I think another time that I, they're strikingly, radiantly beautiful is when they're married. I think I've never seen an ugly bride in all my life. Never have. And here the church stands, fully dressed, by her husband, or the bride-to-be, or fiancé-to-be, fully dressed. And look what it says about her. As a splendid bride, that's not in the Greek, that's implied in my translation, without blot or wrinkle, without any sign of impurity, no spots on the white, and no wrinkles, no signs of age, without any spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but consecrated, the words holy, set apart for service of God, consecrated and Faultless. The word here is blameless. It's a sacrificial term. That's where the church stands before Jesus. Washed in his blood. Robed in his righteousness. Radiating not our righteousness, but his righteousness. We walk to the altar with him. And Revelation 19, verses 6 through 9, tell of the wedding of the Lamb. For the church is caught up to be with him. And they are united there. And just as marriage, I think, is permanent... One for one for life. Can you imagine the implications of Jesus and his church? When, friends, when Jesus marries, it's for good. And that means the church will always be with him. Hallelujah. Notice where it says, this is 
the way married men ought to love their wives. How? I think there's three ways, real quickly, how married women ought to love their wives. The first one is found up here, where it says, uh, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, men all love their lives in a self-giving, sacrificial way. Number B is down here where it says, they ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Verse 28, and just to fulfill the metaphor, the next one is down in verse 31 where it says, there they must leave father and mother and be glued to their wives. So there's the priority of the marriage over against parents. Now let's go back to, as they do their own body. Does that mean that to love your wife is to love yourself? In a real sense. For you see, Paul is thinking of Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, something happens in Jesus Christ that mathematicians still scratch their head over. One plus one in Jesus equals one. And the two became one flesh. One flesh. When a husband loves his wife, he's doing nothing less than loving himself in a real sense. That lady you married is nothing more than extension psychologically, physically, relationship-wise, and every other way of who you are as a person. Because in Jesus Christ there's a bond so thick and so deep that it can almost be spoken of as a oneness instead of a two-ness. Love your wives as you love yourselves. And this metaphor of their own bodies, I think, goes back to verse 23 about Christ and his church. Married men who love his wife is really loving himself. For no one ever hated his own physical person, but look at these two words in verse 39, but feeds it and fosters it. The word feeds it is a word in Greek that means to feed something to maturity. It's the word it's used of feeding a baby bird that gets big enough to fly on its own. Listen to me, husbands. We are to so love our wives as to bring out of them the fullness of the potential that God created them for. We are to love them to the capacity of who they are as a child of God. We are to nurture and love them not in what we want them to do, but until they express the fullness of what God created them to be. We must love them to maturity. And then it says we must foster them. The word here is to keep warm to keep warm. Isn't that a beautiful picture of one man and one woman in Christ? To nurture to maturity and to keep warm. It goes on, just as Christ does the church. Because we are parts of his body. Notice here he's not talking about husbands anymore or wives, but he's saying we are parts of Jesus' body. Everyone is significant. Everyone is an individual. Everyone has a spiritual gift. Everyone is important. Everyone is needed. Wives or husbands, male or female, is not a spiritual distinction. It may be a functional distinction, but it is not a spiritual distinction. And as we come to the church, we're all individual parts of Jesus' body. Verse 31. King James has a little addition here in the last part of verse 30, but really it comes from Genesis 2.23. It's not in the better manuscripts and it should be deleted. Uh, verse 31. Therefore, a man sh shall leave his father and mother. Here's Genesis 2.24. And so perfectly unite himself to his wife, the two shall become one. The word in Hebrew, unite, is the word glue. And I think the neatest thing I have ever done is to get my fingers stuck together with super glue. You ever done that? We got some glue on the market today that is unbelievable. You let, let it sit 30 seconds and you are attached. <laughs> You're not kind of attached. It's get the razor blade out and you just cut part of your finger off. I was working with something that Jason broke sometimes and I got my fingers together like that. Well, that looks stupid. You can't leave it like that. And I had to get a knife and slide it down in there until I get that glue. Friends, you think super glue is something. You ought to see what Jesus Christ does in a home. Now, he'll put a glue on you. It won't come loose. Glue yourself to your wife. This means that the priority relationship, and listen to this, parents. I know it's hard to let go. I know it's hard to break the umbilical cord. But the priority spiritual relationship is not parent's child. It's man and wife. 
That is the priority relationship. And when in-laws come in conflict in the home, the in-laws are wrong. Always. The priority under Jesus Christ is a man and a woman in Christ. Always. Now, verse 32. This is a great mystery. No kidding. <laughs> now, this has been so fought over that the Roman Catholics add, this is a great sacrament. <laughs> Marriage is a sacrament in the Roman Catholic Church. Where did they get that from? They, they, the Latin Vulgate put the word for mystery and changed it to sacrament. If you don't believe me, just get any Latin Vulgate and just get any, any Greek text. You get West Cotton Heart, you get American Bible Society, you get the Textus Receptus, you get any Greek manuscript, and you find me the word sacrament in any Greek manuscript, and I will eat it without ketchup. What is the great mystery? What is the mystery? Is Paul talking about a man and a woman being one, or about Jesus Christ and the church being one? Paul wanted to say in a real sense that the church and Jesus are one. That's what he wanted to say. But the whole context has been marriage. But he's kept, he's kept filing in the church and Jesus all through this wife and husband deal. So he comes now to talk about the union of man and woman, and that is marvelous. But the thing that's more marvelous, even that one man and one woman becoming one something, is Jesus and his church becoming one something. And the great mystery is the union of sinful men, Jews and Greek, with the faultless, sinless Son of God forever. Now, there's the mystery. He says it right there. This is a great mystery. I mean this about Christ and the church. Now, the context is not Christ and the church. The context is the Christian home. But the great mystery is the union of Christ and his church. Verse 33 is a summary verse of what I've tried to say. But each one of you married men must love his wife, present imperative, day by day. Love his wife, gape, as he loves himself, and married women must respect present middle. Respect by means of yourself. It is not a command. It is a request. A strong request, but it's on purpose different. The only command is husband's love. And it's husband's love. Wives submit themselves in respect. You say, well, who's first? This ain't no ladder. <laughs> they no series. There ain't no who's up, who's down, who's first, who's second, who's on top, who's on the bottom, who's number one, who's number two. This is the relationship between a man and a woman in Christ. Self-giving love, submitting respect. Present, middle, subjunctive. Questions or comments? Yes. The day we say, why aren't you submitting, is the day we've lost the battle. For submitting is a voluntary love relationship. It's kind of like, um, kind of like humility. To say, oh, how humble I am. <laughs> you know, what does it do? It just... uh, same, too, with, with pushing this, like saying, I told you to do something, why don't you do it? The Bible says, submit, you do whatever I want to, that's what it means. No. If I had to have a chronological order, if I had to, no, I don't think I have to, but if I had to, it would be husband's love because of the present middle, I mean, present imperative, and be wives submit because of the present, I mean, yeah, the middle imperative. So, uh, I think the husband's love, because of the context, should come first, because submitting is always a voluntary thing based on the other relationship. We've got to remember the day in which it was written. 
Paul had to speak to the wives first because of their place in society. And yet the very thing he said was astoundingly shocking to the hearers of his day. <laughs> oh, it was radical. It was radical. I think a better cross would not be between a husband and a wife talking about their mutual obligations, but would be a Christian teacher talking about the mutual obligation. Be better for me to tell someone to submit than for their husband to tell them. Uh, and that is only because uh, I am pulled back some. And, uh, but I feel like that we always jump in the other people's uh, courtyard and say, I'm going to help you serve because I know what you need. Now, wait a minute. Get in your own side of the net. <laughs> I'll take care of this court. You know, you do your part and I'll do mine. And we're always wanting to, you do yours first. Well, I think the biblical thing is that b both come together in this relationship. And remember, and it's very important you remember this, submit ourselves one to another is the universal principle and wives and husbands is only one small example on the overarching principle. One example of submitting one to another. So see, what we've got here is mutual submission even in the home. Right? 